really do want to welcome you for joining us today for this really, really critical conversation. My name is Judy Marbles. I'm the director here at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I want to do a shout out for Alicia McGill, who are managing the tech, as is Amber. So, actually, our first fully hybrid program. So, we'll see how it goes. But we're also really glad to welcome those of you who are with us today in the auditorium, and there are hundreds of you who are listening online. So thank you so much for being here. I also want to thank um, our partners, Mark Blattner and the Jewish Federation of Greater Portland and Congregation of Israel. Always wonderful to be working with you. If it's your first time visiting the museum or participating in one of our programs, I really hope it won't be your last. We have a number of great opportunities this summer to stay up connected, we're doing walking tours, rooftop events, and of course the Judy Chicago's um, show downstairs cannot be missed. On July 12th at 5.30, we're going to hold a special program. It will be a hybrid program, so you're welcome to come in for person or listen in online. And we're going to be in conversation with two artists, Sarah Horowitz and Shelley Jordan. They will be in conversation with art historian Sarah Diver, looking at um, Chicago's influence on contemporary Jewish art practice. So sure to be a great program July 12th at 5.30. I actually happened to be working in Judy Chicago's archives in Berlin, New Mexico, when the SCOTUS decision was inked. So not surprisingly, I was aware as I was working that Judy Chicago, who was, um, she lives where the archives are, so she was contacted by a number of uh, newspapers to make a comment. And the next day, there was an article in the um, Guardian where she was featured. And I'll just give a quote that she, what she said about the leak and what we knew was inevitably to come. She said, this is a story of pushing forward and pushing backwards. We're in a period of pushing back. And here we are, January 22nd, 1973, an overwhelming majority of Supreme Court justices affirmed the right of women and girls to choose to have an abortion. Last Friday, June 24th, 2022, nearly 50 years later, a majority of Supreme Court justices revoke this. Today, we have an opportunity to hear from three thoughtful and knowledgeable community members about what Jewish law and tradition have to say about reproductive rights and abortion. And I'm so grateful that they are with us today. I am going to introduce our distinguished panelists, Commissioner Myron, is coming. She was in a uh, commissioner's meeting, could not leave until the end of the meeting. Or is she's in a car and will be joining us shortly. So I will introduce everyone. Judith Arcana on, the, on my right, lives in Portland, lives here in Portland. She writes stories, poems, essays, and books. She's a Jane. I have to slow down. <laughs> Um, Judith is a Jane, that is, she's, she was a member of Chicago's pre-Roe Underground Abortion Service, and she appears in the new HBO documentary, The Janes. I urge everybody to watch this documentary. I was saying to Judith, it's actually, it's, it's brilliant, and it's beautifully made. So, uh, Judith, when did it come out recently? Like, yes, well, it had a, a preview. It, oh, sorry. Okay. All right. Well, night now. Um, it came out. Um, in its initial form in January of the Sundance Festival. And it's it been futzing with it ever since. But now, no more futzing because it's on HBO and we can't do that anymore. <laughs> so. so your poetry collection, Judith's poetry collection, What If Your Mother includes poems about abortion, adoption, by the app, her story collection, Hello, This Is Jane, includes fiction about abortion and tattooing. Very Rabbi Rachel Joseph joined Congregation Beth Israel in July of 2012, sharing her passion to, for commitment to, and leadership in community building. She's a leader in social and racist, racial justice activism and in equity and inclusion efforts with Congregation Beth Israel and greater Portland communities. Rabbi Joseph serves on the boards of Planned Parenthood, Columbia Willamette, and Planned Parenthood. The Advocates of Oregon. She's a, best, a member of the National Clergy Advisory Board for Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Dr. Sharon Myron, welcome, Commissioner. We're so glad you are here. There's water for you. 
serves as District 1 Commissioner for Multnomah County, also practices emergency medicine in the Portland area. She uses her experience on the front line caring for those in crisis to inform her policy and advocacy work. Her key focus areas include behavioral health, housing and homelessness, community safety, coordination of services for the most vulnerable, reproductive health care, equity, and justice. Our moderator this afternoon is Stephen M. Wasserstrom, Professor of Humanities and Judaic Studies, Reed College. Well known to many of us. <laughs> we, have lots of, we hope we have lots of time for your questions. I think we will. If you're listening in online, please put your questions in the Q&A. Please don't put them in the chat. It's really hard to monitor both. Um, I'm now going to turn the program over to Steve with a profuse thanks to everyone who's participating today. This is a reminder to the panelists and Steve, if you can make sure the mic is very close to your mouth, that would be very helpful so everyone online can, our mic over there can pick it up. Speak slowly-ish, um, and <laughs> um, I think that that's it, just keeping the mic close up will be really helpful. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I wish I could say uh, I was happy to. I'm happy to be here with you today. Of course, we all know it's uh, it's a tough time. It's an uh, undoubtedly a difficult conversation. It's an important one. I thank OJMCH for making it possible. So, a uh, nice diversity of professions among our panelists and a, way, a range of experience, which is diverse, and I think will be. Uh, exciting for all of us, a rabbi, a doctor, a physician, and an artist and veteran activist for women's reproductive health for a long time. Given the substantial turnout for this event, especially online, we clearly can see that many Jews are eager to learn more from the panelists, from their range of experience, about how the overthrow of Roe versus Wade affects us, as individual Jews and how it may have harmed the Jewish community in general. OJM CAG is here to provide as much information and perspectives as we can. I probably don't need to remind you this, this won't be a debate, this is an educational panel. The Supreme Court decision after the Roe decision, I might just mention as you no doubt all know concern prayer in schools. Here again, I will observe the Jewish community's rights are potentially infringed. Joseph, uh, Justice Sotomayor included a photo in her dissenting opinion in order to illustrate that the prayer in dispute was not an innocently, innocently private, but rather was a cluster of players at the center of a football field. If one were a Muslim player, or a Jewish player, or a Sikh player, the photo shows vividly that the players praying were exposed publicly and therefore could not simply opt out. So church-state separation, while a topic for another day, is clearly part of a package of court decisions that have a potentially deleterious effect on American Jews. Uh, just before we start, I wanna invoke three names, if I may. Uh, the first is Jacilla Pearl, who is an OBGYN in Auschwitz, who devoted her time um, in the death camp to abortions, because the children who were being born would be the subjects of human experimentation. Um, and after the war, she became a very uh, distinguished um, OBGYN and delivered many babies. The second one uh, is Partly personal, we came from Toronto while, while we were there. There was a considerable conflict over abortion, including the bombing of uh, a clinic. The clinic was led by Henry Morgenthaler, a Holocaust survivor, who always invoked also his, his experience and his Jewish background in his defense of um, reproductive rights and care. And finally, I would like to mention Heather Booth, um, Judiths, who you can see in the James, um, in March of 2020, so she, she was one of the leaders of the James. Um, in 2020, Booth received the Raphael Lemkin 
Human Rights Award from TRUA, the rabbinic call for human rights. The TRUA announcement says in part, Heather Booth has committed her life to bringing a Jewish lens to work for social justice. And that began with women's reproductive rights. Uh, we will proceed. Um, we'll start with Judith Arcana and, um, and then Rabbi Rosa and then Jared Mara. Thank you, Steve. And thank you all for being here, both in human form and on the machine. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to, as they say in circumstances like this, make remarks and uh, try to be relatively brief, although one of the things I realized notes is every single one of these notions that you all would say are betting the same thing could let us talk for the rest of our lives. So I'll try not to do that right now. Um, I brought with me uh, copies of the two books that Steve just mentioned. I will flash them at you now, so I have to put the microphone down. Um, here we go. This one's poetry. This one's stories. Um, and I'm going to uh, probably read a, I'm going to probably read a poem or two before the day is or before this day's meeting is done. Um, and I'm hoping that the museum's gift shop will have these available at some point, maybe by the end of the summer. So I'm the history person in this um, panel. I am literally history, which always makes me That's what happens if you live long enough, that's the deal. And I don't mind, actually, because it's endlessly interesting to think about what I know because I'm still alive. Um, in regard to today's topic, um, the focus, of course, is on the work that we did in the underground clinic in Chicago in the late 60s and early 70s that Steve has already alluded to, and that is, of course, featured in that new HBO documentary, The Jennings. Back further, um, I, want, I always want to say, in such circumstances, that abortions have been performed and sustained by the people who needed them for thousands of years, thousands of years. This is not any, you know, we can exaggerate occasionally. This is not an exaggeration. This is something that women have done for and with each other all over this planet for thousands of years. And the Janes happen to be a particular set of people doing that work, but by no means unusual in the history of this species, humans. <laughs> the more recent history, um, Always hard to make it short. Um, what happened was um, Heather, the, the woman that Steve has mentioned, um, made some referrals from her dorm room by telephone for friends that she searched out when people needed abortions. At some point, many, many people started calling her, of course, and she had a meeting with some other feminists in the city that she had already been doing other social justice work with. And um, that group, not Heather actually, she went on to other things, um, started what became known as the Abortion Counseling Service of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union, which is a very long name. So two things happened. One, we who were James um, called it the service, we still do. And now people just call it Jane because that's what everyone used as our fake name. Um, when we were, because we were illegal. We were, in fact, felons. When abortion is not healthcare, it is, or it was in Illinois, and I'm betting it will be elsewhere, felony homicide. Yeah, it's quite a phrase, isn't it? Um, so what happened was we began with referrals, we moved into counseling, training ourselves and each other, and then we realized that we could learn from the best abortionist we had contracted with. Um, he was very, 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 very good. He was good to the women who came to us, and he was an ace at doing abortions. And so we leaned on him to teach us. And it wasn't his first choice, but ultimately for a set of reasons, see the movie. Um, uh, he acquiesced, and he liked us, and we liked him. And um, we learned. 
first one, then two, then three, then maybe a half dozen or more James learned the medical stuff, as we called it. And then he went away and we remained as a self-sustaining underground illegal abortion clinic in Chicago until a couple months after the Roe decision in 1973. Um, we often argued about tactics and practice as any group does. And even after the Roe decision, we argued about whether we should close. Um, clearly that's the decision we made. And so a couple months later we did. But the argument was, we are good at this. We are like the people who come to us that will not happen with the medical industry. Again, I pause to let that sink in. That's where our heads were. Some of them then started a clinic. Um, I went on to other stuff teaching about women's bodies and health and sexuality and so on. It's probably enough minutes, yeah? <laughs> sure, there's going to be plenty of follow-up to that, no, no doubt. No, no. Uh, I got words. And, uh, Next, we'll hear from Rabbi Joseph. And so I think a nice segue is why are there, were there so many Jews a part of the reproductive freedom movement? So I'm wearing today a necklace um, that online you probably can't see. Um, the necklace is actually, but on the necklace is a hanger. So for my bat mitzvah, and this is true, I confirmed it with my mother this morning, that in 1990, I was given lifetime membership to the National Council of Jewish Women with a necklace at the time that was with my Hebrew name, Rachel, and this coat hanger. Wow. wow. That was my bat mitzvah present, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, um, I was wearing this today. Now I'm wearing it on a necklace that said Tzedek. Part of that, which means justice, um, part of that is because um, I'm learning that this is a symbol that is outdated um, and from our BIPOC community that it's one in which we have to really contextualize and not wear around all the time. But I wanted to wear it today because I think it really illustrates the Jewish involvement. Uh, when I was in a meeting earlier this morning with a family and a woman my age said, did you get that from NCJW? Because <laughs> I got one too. <laughs> Right, so it is really quite remarkable to think about how steep in our tradition and our Jewish values to be involved in reproductive freedom. And that's because from the Bible to rabbinic commentaries, to Talmud, to all sorts of takes on reproductive freedom from, as we're talking about thousands of years, to modernity, that rabbis have wrestled and the Jewish community have wrestled with these issues. And time and time again, they've come out on the side of protecting the life of the pregnant person. Protecting the life of the pregnant person as opposed to potential life. That as a Jewish community and our Jewish values say that we place the emphasis on the existing life. That's what takes priority. And we have even modern, even modern day commentary, even in Orthodox community, you go to the rabbi, you have this conversation, and they go through all the different commentaries and come out on the side of preserving the life, the existing life. It's incredibly clear and powerful. There are many Jewish values that play into this. So we see this, again, even in the Bible, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, a lot of the ways that we interpret our tradition are from rabbinic literature, but we see even in the Bible where there's an example of getting into an altercation and if there's a fight and there's a pregnant person involved in this fight and the fetus is lost, you pay monetary damages. It's not considered a criminal act. It's not considered murder because it's not separate from human being. Yet if the pregnant person dies in this altercation, then it is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. So even in the Bible, so then the rabbinic commentators take this and they take it in lots of different directions. We're not gonna get into all of the different texts in this moment. Um, I'll plug that uh, I am gonna do a, a text study. We've done them over the years, but everyone is welcome on July 13th. 
um, at noon. We'll send the Zoom link around um, to join to really look at some of the text. It's a little bit hard to do this in sort of a panel conversation in this way. But not only do we have these texts throughout the ages, we have all these Jewish values, these Jewish values of human dignity, kavod habriot, the human dignity of shalom bayit, of peace in the house, all of these, of tsar, of pain. All these different Jewish values come into play when we make these decisions, the utmost, the most important decisions that we're gonna make about our body autonomy, about our families, about our community, about our life. And so that's also why, as Steve pointed out, um, this is such an affront to our Jewish values. It's an affront to the establishment of religion. Because as I'm wearing from NCJW, abortion bans are against my religion. They're against my religion. And I'll close, which will be a good pass to Sharon. She doesn't know this is coming. <laughs> but that, that um, when I gave birth to my son, Max, I had an emergency C-section. It was 21 minutes from getting there to being my father totally under. It was very scary. My life was at risk. His life was at risk. Everything panicking. What are we going to do? And that feeling, I can't, I will start crying even thinking about it. And I'm laying there on the table like it's happening. And I looked at the doctor and I said, you have to save me. Please save me. Please save me. My life is worth more. I'm Jewish. And he looked at me and he said, we are a Catholic hospital. Oh. Now, as I like to say, thankfully, we were both okay. It was incredibly scary. The rest of the story is even better. Um, Max is 11 years old, enjoying being overnight at baby camp right now, living his best life. Um, but that was in that moment. It was a violation of my bodily autonomy with the violation of my religious freedom. And so it is incredibly personal and incredibly important as a Jewish woman as well. Thank, thank you. Just, just if I can add a footnote, um, OJMCAG will be at um, posting a few articles that will uh, deal with the Jewish text. So for the folks who want to follow up on some of those points. Um, next, uh, Dr. Commissioner Sharon Myron. Hi, uh, Sharon Myron, and I uh, am a Multnomah well, County Commissioner. I am a practicing emergency physician, not many shifts these days. Uh, I was the medical director for the Oregon Foundation for Reproductive Health, and I actually was a lawyer a long time ago. <laughs> um, and and I am a mom, and I am a Jewish woman, and throughout all of my intersecting identities, this issue uh, is front and center. What I'm going to speak to now and tie it to some of these other things, maybe a little bit later, but is, is my perspective as a physician. And in the ER, we see all comers. We see people who come in who have fallen through the cracks in so many of these social systems that were supposed to protect them and support them. We see people in crisis. We see people on truly their worst day. And we provide the care that they need. And in my role as an ER doctor, I have cared for thousands of women uh, from all different backgrounds. And I have cared for numerous people. And, and actually, I want to expand on that because it is not just women. It is uh, gender non-binary folks. This issue affects anyone uh, with reproductive capabilities and people who are, uh, and, and future decisions by the Supreme Court are poised to address all sorts of um, what I consider to be foundational human rights, particular, particularly LGBTQIA plus rights. Um, and it is horrific. So I see people who have suffered the consequences of failure to be able to access re basic reproductive health services including abortion services. And they will come in, they have come in 
with complications from unwanted pregnancies. They have come in uh, with, we, I diagnosed them with pregnancies they didn't even know they had and then refer them to places where they can uh, terminate the pregnancy if that is their desire. Uh, there, I take care of people who have been victims of sexual assault and uh, prescribe emergency contraception and, uh, and counsel them and offer them supports to follow up in those dire, dire situations. And I have always, I've always felt privileged to be in the role of a healthcare provider as a physician, as a healer, to be there for my patients. And uh, even at times when sometimes the individual stories are tragic, at least we can be there for people. And as I've been thinking about this ruling, anticipating it, but now just seeing it, which I still can't get my brain around, uh, I realize a lot of what I have done and what I will continue to do, because fortunately we are in Oregon, yay, uh, where we have the strongest protections on reproductive freedom, including access to abortion. But I could face uh, criminal charges for providing some of the care that I currently provide. We don't know the implication of these laws. If people are coming over the border, abortion refugees, if they are coming into our state and need care, what does that mean if their state has a restriction on access and criminalizes the provider of abortion services or other medical support for reproductive health care? Uh, and so, this is a very, very scary time. And I know I have colleagues in many of these other states and how can we support them and the women and others who they are serving at this time. So there's conversation happening about the legal implications. There is fear and there is anger, there is outrage and we are gonna fight back. Uh, but it is a scary time unlike no other I've ever encountered. Thank you. And with that, we'll move into the questions that are coming in online. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just asking. Some of my own. Oh, okay. I was going to skip it because I expected them to make boy. Um, well, uh, I'm just going to bring it back to some of the. Um, Jewish questions, uh, obviously, since we're at the Oregon Jewish Museum. Uh, and I thought, um, what, and one of the comments that has come in already is what we can do as a Jewish community uh, as actions that are important within our purview today. And I turn it over to my panelists. <laughs> Uh, I think that there are many things that we can do. Many of them are probably known to everyone in this room and watching on the box. Um, organizing, marching, carrying on, putting pressure on politicians who are in office or will be in office in the future as well. And um, that kind of stuff. Also, I think in terms of this program on this day in this place, um, I want to read establish, no, not establish, reaffirm um, the notion, the belief, the reality, historically speaking, that Jews have always associated ourselves with social justice movements and actions, and that it is not an accident that there were an unusual, there was an unusual percentage of Jews in the, abort, the underground abortion service, um, starting with Heather in her dorm room, and then moving to service that couple months after Roe, I think that those of us who take our identity, our identities as Jews in the serious ways that I'm pretty sure most of us do, um, need to think about, probably are already thinking about, well, in the face of all this misery, in the face of all this evil, I use that word deliberately, I never used to use that word, but now I guess I have to. Um, 
you got to think about what about our community historically and in the present. Um, what do Jews do under these circumstances? What is this Jew going to do under these circumstances? What does it mean to me, to you, to any of us, that when I consider these questions, I'm thinking as a Jew, I'm feeling as a Jew. And I want to take that a step further um, because I want to take it to be real, to be explicit. I think as Jews, we are implicit. We think of it implicitly that we are doing this because we are Jewish and our Jewish values encourage us to do X, Y, and Z and act in this way. But we don't say that out loud to anybody. I want to reclaim the public square and religion that my religion, the God of my understanding says abortion is okay. And sometimes it's even mandated. The God of my understanding says abortion is okay. And it's amazing to me that I still, especially in the circles in which I um, run now in Portland with Planned Parenthood, Columbia Willamette, Planned Parenthood of Athens, Oregon, where people are still like, wait a minute, we, there's religious people who live? Yes, my God says this. And, and we have we have seeded, this has been a, 50 years see more than that, of, you know, religion to um, evangelical Christians, to the religious right, to the extremists, who do not speak for me, who do not speak, I imagine, for many of us. And so I think it's it sometimes feels uncomfortable. I sometimes feel uncomfortable also as a Jew, right, because of our intergenerational trauma, um, to be so explicit. But now more than ever, I think we need to be really clear that I am religious and I believe on, I believe in access to all aspects of religious freedom, of, of reproductive freedom. I believe in abortion. And so that's 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 how I would just take it to the next. Yeah, oh my gosh. Um, and I love that. And um and I would take it even a step Do further. <laughs> Um, and I, I uh, in talking about reclaiming that um, and uh, being religious, I actually, I am not religious, but I'm a Jew. And I uh, subscribe to the spiritual um, and social justice aspects of Judaism, and it is how I identify and I will continue to do so. And it, so it is even more, I think, more inclusive with identification of your one's Judaism and that spirit and expanding it to, um, to who, who we are as a people. And that I, I love that you brought up the historic trauma because it is definitely, it is so present as I am in forums in different places where people are speaking to their experiences and their traditions and the religious aspects of this, whether it's in debate or in whatever context. And I kind of hesitate. I, I think, I, you know, do I bring this up in like the context of being Jewish? And, um, and often I, I'm ashamed to say I don't and I am from now I mean from here on out it is it needs to be at the forefront because it is it is both important in reclaiming identity but also in the argument just the very arguments that are being made to subvert the right to abortion that this is a religious issue and um well, sure, if it's a religious issue, then you are violating my religious freedom. And so uh, taking it to that level. So I think that there is such an opportunity to come together around that particular element. And I look forward to you, our uh, Jewish rabbi leader, to um, leading the charge. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um,
I'm also on the No God team, but as Jewish as anybody, I would love to have that with you sometime. Hey, come on, I'll talk to you. Um, but what I want to say, and this is okay, now this is going to be a bummer and a downer, but I really think I have to tell you when I was doing some more looking through old notes and then looking for new notes to prepare for today, I discovered, and y'all can go to this website online. The Jewish Pro Life Foundation. Oh my God. Exactly my very response. <laughs> and I went to their website, which is extremely well done, professionally speaking, in terms of the layout and so on. These people are on the other team and they say that they are Jews. And I was stunned because of what <coughs> we've all said here and what I thought all my life, which as I pointed out is a long time now. But here they are. There they are. And I'll probably check them out some more, but I I couldn't do this without saying what and then telling you this exists. This exists. And why should we be surprised to think that I said to myself last night, why should I be surprised to think that we can do no wrong? <coughs> so I thought I'm going to tell them. <laughs> so two Jews, three opinions. Right, it's always going to um, to be like that. Of course, there's no such thing as a monolith, right? That's why even I'm talking about there's text from biblical to today. Um, but still, if I was in a community in which I looked to a rabbinic figure as helping me understand what I should do in my life, making my choices, um, then you still go to that rabbinic figure and say, "Here's the case. Here's what's happening in my life. What should I do?" So there's still going to be so the difference. I was starting to think about this yesterday that, um, you know, not just yesterday, but it's funny how the, um, the difference between rights and responsibilities. So in Judaism, we're based on a system of meets vote. Those are responsibilities. They're not inalienable rights. A lot of times we, the, the courts make this connection that, oh, we, in America, we're based on this Judeo-Christian system. It's not actually really true. Because it's very different with rights. Rights can be taken away. Rights can be given. Responsibility is a way in which we exist and evolve and have to each other. So it's, so it's a different way of looking at how you interpret these texts and apply these texts. Um, and of course, when you frame it in the context of rights and, you, like, and how I would speak as a liberal Jew, you're going to have people that say, no, you're wrong. This is how I say my rights. Um, and again, at the same time, this, this is a bit, this is why I want to reclaim the God language, and I'd love to unpack God with anybody who would ever like to do that, um, <laughs> is that we, we, as we become more polarized, um, we do see that there are those in the ultra-Orthodox world who have hooked their wagons to the evangelical Christians. And that is for a myriad of reasons. And while abortion is not the one that they're really hooking their wagon to for, it is a trade for many others. Um, and so we saw that just now with this decision, because when the press release from the Jewish Council on Public Affairs came out, which is an umbrella political organization that really represents um, most of the national Jewish organizations, there was a little asterisk, right, that um, a couple of the Orthodox organizations were not signing on to that statement, where historically they have been affirmed. Commentaries haven't changed. Bible hasn't changed. <laughs> Alma hasn't changed. Right? So the political in that, and I think the rights and responsibilities play a role in how we interpret that. There's a lot. There's a lot on the table, and there's a lot coming in from the um, from the online participants. Um, I'm going to fold some of them together um, and, uh, and turn it back to the panelists. And that has to do with the, the line between uh, church and state between religious and uh, legal rights and responsibilities. Um, and um, let me start with making it concrete. This has already been brought up. Um, we all wondering what we can do. Um, there's been, so I, I wanna uh, see, if, first of all, can there be a legal uh, challenge based on the First Amendment? Can we have a coalition with other religious groups? Certainly this infringes the rights of Muslims who have a similar religious definition of the beginning of life as Jews do, uh, and other religious communities. 
Um, and um, I have one more question about it. And how, how can we mobilize our community into uh, midterm elections locally and nationally that need our support, particularly from a Jewish mindset? Voting is obviously number one. Is it? We know again in the Jewish community, we are disproportionately engaged in voting rights. Again, not surprising. Um, and I would say so at our synagogue, we've been very involved in the national campaign of every voice, every vote, um, and, and really sort of contacting, reaching out all over the country, helping um, disenfranchise communities and making sure everyone has access to voting. And I would say we cannot lose sight of Oregon. As Sharon said, we are the most accessible state in the entire country. We have no access to care. Unlike any other state, we are better than California and Washington. Oregon is, I mean, really wrap our brains around this, in the entire country. But it has not always been that way. And it might not always be that way. If we become complacent and believe that we can just rest on that, um, and we can just sort of live in our bubble and pretend that it can't change. Um, and so we must do the work outside of Portland um, to really engage voters. And, and I would say, you know, to we, lately we've all seen the Audre Lorde, we've been reminded of the Audre Lorde quote that there's no such thing as a one issue voter, because there's no such thing as a one issue life. Um, and one of the really important things is that while this is such an important hot button issue, um, that, re that reproductive freedom is not just about access to abortion. It is about how do we live in a safe world where we can raise the kids that we have in the way that we want to raise them? How do we have safe schools? How do we have access to nutritious food and healthcare and an environment in which we can thrive? That is, that is how we go from reproductive freedom to reproductive justice. And that's the multi-tiered issue and platform and way in which we need to engage voters and not only maintain the level of protection that we have in this state, but build all those other issues to become a model of what we can really look like, not only access to healthcare, but access to everything else we need to raise healthy, happy families. And I think that's something that we as a Jewish community can be heavily involved in. I was just gonna say here, here, and uh, and that that um, does tie my role as a, as a physician, but that ties to my role as a county commissioner where, um, you know, we are a public health authority, we are the mental health authority, we are, um, we are the uh, policy makers around so many of these issues of, uh, of lifting people up uh, and supporting their needs and coming together as a community and justice. And, uh, and so our policies need to wrap around all of that. And, um, and so it's both, there is no single issue and, and yet there is, but that issue is big. <laughs> it's that issue is everything. I would add only this that um, I, I totally agree. First of all, with what my two pals here have just said um, about voting and about the political <coughs> structure, but also no doubt based on what I learned um, back in the old days, pre-row, um, there are very simple. I know that may sound like I'm fooling around, but I'm not. There are very simple things we can do that are not necessarily defined as political. We don't have to do the organizing in the, or the rallying in the streets. We don't have to do, we have to vote, that's for sure. But we don't have to do the stuff around that. We can do like providing, actually like schlepping the food to the places it needs to be. Somebody's got to do the grunt work as well as the political intellectual strategizing work. And that is extremely rewarding, extremely rewarding, as well as being insanely necessary. So I encourage us to do what 
I'm going to keep calling the grunt work as well, signing up, showing up, and doing those apparently quote unquote simple things that are absolutely necessary. Thank you. Um, one, I'm going to um, suggest one last question. We have we have uh, questions from the audience here. Um, I'm just going to read one last question that has come in uh, that seems to be significant. One of the consequences of the ruling will be more children born into poverty, born to families that cannot afford them. It should be noted that the very lawmakers who celebrate this decision are the very same who generally wish to gut governmental social safety net programs. How can we better influence the public discourse on abortion um, concerning this hypocrisy? I hope that to get to that, quint, that, that questioner is what I was trying to say earlier, and that's the reproductive justice. That's this is all intertwined. Um, and I think part of that is those of us who have been so focused on just the abortion part, expand our narrative and our understanding. So organizations like Sister Song, um, which is an amazing BIPOC organization has been doing this work, I mean, for hundreds of years, but for the past several decades, have really been organizing. And again, their platform is, it's not just about healthcare, that's just part of it. But again, how do we raise our families? And so that's, we, we need to be talking about that too. Those of us that come from, I'll speak for myself, from a place of privilege, I'm now trying to speak all the time about this intersectionality and this multi-issue platform, that it's not just one thing, it's all connected. And we know, we've all seen this, right? If it was about the kids, then I wouldn't worry every day I drop my children off at school. So we need to, again, it's about reclaiming. It's really about reclaiming the language and expanding the language. I, I just want to, to um, add to that. It, exactly right. It is about expansiveness. And um, as Jews, it's, a, it's about uh, us being in our, in our role as Jews, being part of that larger um, that larger advocacy and work and um, community that is organizing around this and bringing a very special voice and unique voice, uh, an important voice to that collective table and, um, and that that is, that is mutual and recognizing that the fight for abortion and, and having access again, yes, I have been very privileged. I have never worried that I would not have access to abortion. It's not just because of Roe v. Wade. It is because of my positionality. It's because of who I am, where I was born, the color of my skin, and um, and many people, even during Roe v. Wade, who are black, brown, other people of color, um, people who grow up in poverty, have not had that luxury, have not had true access, even with Roe v. Wade in place. And so we need to be thinking more broadly and expansively. And again, it's it's all of that. Definitely so. And also, we need to remember or maybe people haven't thought about it, so it's not a matter of memory. Um, Roe v. Wade happened um, you know, at the end of January in 73. Only three years later, the onslaught against the value of Roe began with the Hyde Amendment. Henry Hyde from Illinois, alas, where I was living at the time, but I can't take responsibility for everyone else's <laughs> The Hyde Amendment did exactly what you're talking about, Commissioner Meyer. I can probably share. Yeah, please. <laughs> and um, it's about cutting out all the people who could no longer get health care because they couldn't afford it. He knocked, Henry Hyde knocked out the financial possibilities for thousands upon thousands of people. And ever since that first big successful move on the part of the anti-abortion movement, um, they have done similar things all over the country in various ways. This is not news. This didn't just happen with the Supreme Court's decision. The Supreme Court's decision is a culmination 
of over 45 years of heavy duty successful political organizing. And now the same thing has to be done in reverse, but still, I want us to remember that, that um, everything she just said is a result of that deliberate choice on the part of the bad guys to make these things happen. It's not an accident, it's not an emotional response in the nation. Uh, there are, there continue to be uh, important questions that are flowing in. I hope we can get through as many as possible. Um, I personally, as a Jewish studies professor, would like to hear more about differences within the Jewish community. Um, Rabbi Joseph, you already addressed that to some extent. Um, we might return to that. I know that's important and a lot of folks are, are interested in hearing about differences within the Jewish community. I want to ask a different question and then maybe we'll We'll go to the floor. Uh, in years past, our reproduction repeats are like being dialed in. In years past, the reproductive health fight has been a coalition of other communities at risk. The issue is privacy. So when we think about the 14th Amendment, the right to privacy and all rights that are at risk being eliminated, there's lots of great ideas for mobilizing that we've mentioned today, but can we break this down a bit? How that right plays into the what if there was the other one? Yeah, that's that is so interesting. And um, and as a physician, you know, obviously uh, right to privacy is is sacrosanct. And we have so many rules in place to guard the the privacy of our patients and the idea that there are states out there, and again, we don't know what those legal implications are going to be, but that physicians in providing care to their, uh, to their patients, how, how is the information going to be gleaned to um, prosecuting anyone? And uh, that seems to be yet another uh, conflict in fundamental constitutional rights, it's privacy, religion, and it's not just one religion, it's all religions, and uh, and how this how this plays into this decision. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, all right, I think it's time that if we open up um, some questions from the floor. Yes. Oh, hi. Thank you so much for this conversation. And as I'm listening to it, I feel my blood boiling in you. But to your point about the Hyde Amendment, I've been sitting here stewing, thinking about leadership in the country. And we have Jewish, a Jewish senator, we have a Jewish, two Jewish representatives. I just hear really little from them. I don't hear anything other than give me money. Um, and I think that our president has a lot of trouble saying the word abortion, and if I recall, he was a supporter of the Hyde Amendment until yes, fairly yes, recently. Yes, yes, yes. So leaving aside the very, very important questions of privilege and intersectionality, to Steve's initial point about if the coach had been doing his Torah portion at midfield, it would have been a very different conversation. <laughs> How do we reclaim some of this Jewish leadership and mm -hmm. really take this away and i don't think it's as easy as working backwards this was 50 years in the making with leadership that i think is slightly complicit in it i think a lot of the senior catholics even the democrats have a lot of trouble getting this out of their mind uh, i'll repeat the question uh, roughly uh, the the question concerns um Jewish representation in the, on the elected level, we have that here. Um, um, we have some other, uh, including a Jewish senator and other elected representatives from the Jewish community here. Uh, and that was one, the first part of the question. The, uh, the other observation that we might want to discuss is pro, um, uh, President Biden's uh, historical opposition to, to abortion and his voting for the Hyde Amendment. Um, so I'm wondering if we can fo follow up on some of these uh, 
for the board. I'm sure we can. <laughs> Do you want to start, Chad? Uh, I, I, you raise really, really um, significant, uh, big, big questions, and I don't, I don't know, but it's something now that I'm going to pursue and um, follow up on. Is what, what our advocacy has been with our, with our delegates, particularly uh, our Jewish delegates and what role they can play and what voice they can raise um, regarding this issue because it is, some of it is just, is talking about this more. It's what, what you mentioned, Rabbi, um, reclaiming that and not just letting it slide under and holding, holding those representatives to account for doing that. And so, Representative from Michigan, Levin, who I assume is Jewish, mm -hmm. whose response was supposed to, you know, pose a yeah, pose of himself doing a yoga pose. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. it's this is really interesting, and I don't know if you have any more. No, I mean, things. again, I think I think it's about speaking out. I mean, we do a lot of advocacy with our delegation of um, a congregation, Beth Israel. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Some might say we do too much. Um, that that is central. We're never too much, as Rabbi Kahana would say. He just came from another press release, you know, dealing with lift every voice for again. He can talk about a, another issue um, that's so important to the safety of raising families and kids. Um, so we are constantly talking to our delegation. One of the things we do with our students is we take them to Washington, D.C. as share knows from her own children and educate them and take them up to lobby and all of that. And so, yes, we need to continue to encourage them to be explicit. Again, I think it comes down to we just had too many years of resting on our laurels, of not being explicit in our language of who we are and why we bring this. And you don't get to be the only religious person in the room because that's the beauty of this country. So I used to be a lobbyist for American Tonight for Separation of Church and State before I became a rabbi. And I'd always play this game with people. How many religions, how many registered religions do you think there are in this country? Let's hear a guess. Keep going. Keep going. Over 2,000. Over 2,000 religions. And that is what makes this country the best country in the world because of the freedom of religion. And when we lose that, everything else falls. And that is exactly what we're seeing. Because when the Macon decision came out, saying that it was discrimination in Maine, Alito said it was discrimination that taxpayers were not funding religious schools. He took this and he turned discrimination around. And he said the main taxpayer should be paying for two schools that explicitly discriminate against queer families, explicitly in their admission guides and in their curriculum. And then, yes, you see those pictures. Bremerton is right outside of Seattle. This case, Kennedy versus Bremerton, right outside of Seattle. It is, it is not far from here. It is not like Eastern Oregon, or we can just pretend it was somewhere else. And if you ask rabbis, it's not the same for me in Portland, but it's interesting as the Bremerton case comes down, and they were asking rabbis, what is the number one thing that you deal with with your students and the number one thing that a lot of rabbis deal with is their students in sports and being overlooked for positions not given play time because they don't participate in the religious activities that are voluntary in public schools when the freedom of religion falls everything else falls okay <laughs> Footnote, um, I think that one thing we can ask of or demand of, depending on our mood, uh, rele uh, elected officials is that they out themselves as Jews and not just once, but to say, well, I'm a Jew. And so for me, this sounds like it's actually about Christianity, not about religion. So, and if I were a Muslim, blah, 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 blah. But opening with outing themselves as Jews, I think that could go a long way. 
Granted, it will make them very anxious. And I, you know, but anxiety, isn't that a Jewish thing? <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm actually quite serious about this. I think we have a lot of good reasons to shut up about being Jews. We have a lot of good reasons. But I think that this will take precedence over those reasons, because this is the present. The past is in us, but we don't live in the past. Yes. Well, if I can follow up on that, you know, clearly we're not the only religious community that feels threatened. So oh. is safety in numbers? Can we imagine that we can band together with our Muslim colleagues and other religious organizations that are facing the same threats? And mm -hmm. Absolutely. How do we do that? Everybody comes out. The, que the question concerns co coalition building with the Muslim community and other religious communities that might have a common cause with us. This work has been going on, thankfully, for decades. So there's already amazing coalitions of interfaith, multi-faith work. Um, an older coalition that is, that is actually still around, but the reproductive, um, the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, RCRC, um, you know, is still active in many states. Um, and that we, we do, so yes, it exists. Um, we have to continue to build and strengthen. I'll just say again, as someone who's an interloper to um, Portland and to Oregon, <laughs> you know, that it's been a, um, a very different experience to be a religious person in, in this state. Um, and there isn't as much of that infrastructure as I've experienced in other places in the country, because this happens to be, you know, the most unchurched city in America. So, um, but I actually think that provides a lot of opportunity so it is something that we could we could galvanize and reinvigorate um, in a way. And again, there are, there are lots of multi-faith leaders that get together and um, do really important work. But I think it's it is a great time to re-engage. Um, there's another question. Let's uh, answer, please. Hi, I'm Nancy Becker. First of all, thank you very much. This is really wonderful. I just want to bring it back to Oregon for a minute. Um, we have a very pro-choice legislature right now, but watch out. The other side is building up. They've already got bills that they're ready to go to stop Oregon from being one of the most pro-choice uh, states in the union. And there is something you can do. There's an organization called WINPAC, the Women's Investment Network, PAC, which I'm on the board of, and we give money to pro-choice Democratic women who are running for office in Oregon. And now if you have an extra 25 or 50 or $100, now is the time to support an organization like WINPAC to keep Oregon pro-choice. When folks start pouring into Oregon from Idaho, we need to make sure that this state is going to be a safe haven for women from other states who come here for reproductive health. So please go, you can go online, WINPAC Oregon, W I N P A C. And I just thank you very much again for this really wonderful uh, conversation. Thank you. That was more of a, um, a an, an important comment than a question, and, but it, it suggests that some of us might want to support WINPAC Oregon um, to, to do what we can. And to change. we can't take it for granted in Oregon. That's my point, my main point. Um, can, I just, can I just add something a little quick? Sorry. 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 Um, it, uh, it is to, um, to build on what Nancy said about uh, ensuring our state representatives uh, are, are pro-choice. Uh, but it is it is so much more even than that. Our school boards, like you, we need to be watching like hawks um, because there have been some really uh, devastating decisions that impact our youth and uh, reproductive freedom. And so don't, you know, do your best to go down the ballot and look at all of those races and recognize these are really important because the, infiltra the infiltration is happening. There is a concerted effort at all levels of government. Um, and so just you know, be, be aware. Yes. Yeah, so the, uh, the conversation around um, access to abortion and reproductive rights um, is really important. I see it 
and the conversation about infringing upon my religious, my religious rights. It's also about controlling women. It is, it's about controlling me as a woman. What does our Jewish tradition say, Rabbi? What does our Jewish tradition say about that? What's my answer? What's my answer to the religious right or belief in the patriarchy? What can I say as a Jew? The Glenn concerns the patriarchal attempt to control women in, in the present uh, Tell environment. Tell us about the woman I've named after in the Apocrypha, <laughs> Judith of Bethulia. Everybody read that story. She's a great role model. <laughs> Two sides to that point. <laughs> the more, first we must recognize that Jews invented patriarchy, right? That, and we, I, I like to say, let, let me own that and then destroy it, right? So everything was matrilocal before Torah times and we turned it into patrilocal and we turned it into patriarchy. We, I need to be honest about that. I need to be clear about that. And then I need to say, here's how we can reinterpret and destroy. Um, and then this is through our commentaries and our modern commentaries. This comes back to Kavod HaBirot, right? This comes back to my individual integrity and honor and autonomy. Because ultimately that's what our Jewish tradition says, that I have autonomy as a woman and that the fetus is part of me. The rabbinic text, there's even rabbinic literature about how it's just water. For 40 days. It's just water, or it's just like a thigh, it's just like part of my thigh. And it, so it's mine. There's the, the, the really um, difficult text um, is a text where it talks about the fetus becomes a rodent that is actually pursuing the body, the mother's body, and can be actually destroyed, that she can she can destroy it and get rid of it because she has that bodily autonomy. And so I think that's where it's really interesting that of all the things, the text is pretty clear going down. I was just looking, and I wish I had brought copies of it, of an older art a few years ago, an article of Orthodox women sharing their abortion stories. Wow. And I'll, I'll make sure that, um, that you have it. And, you know, about like, having these experiences that were so difficult, but their rabbi is saying, yes, this is what you need to do, and I'll help you do it. And we have a community that will take care of you because your life is paramount. Your existence is paramount. This, the health of your family is paramount. And so that's the health of you. So mental health, physical health, economic health, all of that is what our tradition says comes first. Yes. I have an issue with you with the thought of having to continue to vote in what I consider a long-term nation. I, at this point, basically think that Democrats and Republicans, the majority, two sides of the same point. They have had control over the House and Senate, the executive branch for a little while now, and they've done nothing. Oh, oh no, 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 no. But this for me, as someone who, you know, I am living paycheck to paycheck, I barely scrape it by. I grew up in rural, you know, rural Oregon, and our communities, like, it just keeps getting harder and harder for the people that I know and the people I grew up on with. So it's just so hard to see any sort of opportunity in so many of the people. What I keep seeing is chances getting squandered. And then I get an email about fundraising, <laughs> and I'm like, well, can we do something for us now? That'd be really great. So I'm just wondering if I guess there's any resource out there to find candidates that are actually doing something to get behind. So the question concerns finding candidates that can really do something, um, perhaps beyond you're expressing some frustration between the, the two elected parties now. Um, or NGOs. It doesn't or NGOs. Be candidates. It could be uh, organizations that can that one can be involved with. Really quickly, I apologize for interrupting, but someone's cell phone is going on and there's music yes. on someplace that we're picking up and it sounds like it's in this area. Apologies for interrupting. I wonder if it's in mine. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> okay, I hear it. I hear it too, right? Yes. Anyway, you want to have a minute? 
I'm sorry. Oh, I, I mean, th this is such a big conversation because uh, I, I tend to, uh, to uh, agree with a lot of what you just said, and um, not in the sense that Democrats and Republicans are the same, that, that I don't, uh, don't believe that our political structures uh, are becoming all too similar. And, um, and the way that uh, campaigns happen uh, perpetuate this structure, and um, and I think that is a challenge to our system. That is a bigger conversation. I'd love to have more conversation about that with you, but um, not in relation. The, the, yeah, the, that is a problem, and it does impact this, and it makes it so that even when we elect the, the pro-choice, the Democrat, all of this, and yet still feel that nothing is done, then that is disillusioning for the system. That being said, in Oregon, we do have <clears throat> the strongest protections around reproductive health care and rights and the most expansive. So there is so much that has been done there, but it is threatened all the time. Um, and I was just um, I hear your experience, and I'm sorry that this is the world in which you're living. It's it's not a world that any of us want to live in. And I think this again goes into intersectionality, you know, of the issues and why even talking about um, pro-choice, that the word choice is a place of privilege, right? To have a choice of doing anything. And, and when we're just trying to figure out how to live day to day um, and how to access just your basic needs, how could you even think about there was a choice? And our, our system of government um, is flawed. Uh, and I think a lot of things you're talking about, a lot of times it affects the way block grants come to the states and really getting into the nitty gritty where um, our politicians are doing the best that they can at each level in which they exist. And that there are real people like yourself on the ground who are affected, but disconnected from those actions. And it's unfair and it's unjust. And thankfully there's people like Commissioner Myron who are trying to change the really unjust system that we have in Portland and Multnomah County. And I hope that some of that also trickles out to some of the rest of the state. Thank you. I think, oh, I think too that um, much of the time in our lives in this nation and most of the nations on this planet, of course, um, it may be that the wise decision is to simply get it together ourselves and not expect those people to do what we need them to do. Um, obviously, that's what the attitude of the Janes was and it made a big impression on me. Um, I think that we all have to vote and we all have to think and we all have to do our own work but in order to do what we need to do to live lives that perhaps even have some pleasure in them, um, we got to get it together on our own in a particular location with a particular group of people who agree about what it's, is needed. Thank you. One more question that has come in, and then um, one, I do want to make sure that we also conclude with the, the Jewish question. Yeah, is there anything mobilization going on right now? Yeah, there's national work happening. There's already lawsuits happening in Florida, in other words, and we're really trying to take the lead from the national organizations like National Council of Jewish Women, really um, at the table with lots of different organizations. So that trying to dampen down, like let's not have everybody running without a sort of concerted effort. Also on the local level, um, we should mention the Northwest Abortion Fund out of Eugene um, and uh, OJMCG will put links to a number of the organizations that we've been talking about, as well as the text that we've been talking about on their website. The Atlantic Magazine had a huge article starting with the Talmud and going back 2,000 years 
in terms of the different process of what it's like um, and some other um, and some other interesting things. I think it's really an article that's been written. It's current. This um, one you're talking about. Yeah, I, think, yeah, I think people are talking about that. Yeah, there's a recommendation that you all have a look at the Atlantic magazine, the latest issue, which has a survey of uh, of sources that would be useful for thinking about these issues. I think it's time to wrap up. Um, it's hard. It's a, it's a, it's a, a hard time for all of us in many respects. Um, I do think that we're here at the Oregon Jewish Museum. I teach Jewish studies I'm sitting next to a rabbi, obviously, <laughs> and lots of other Jews, but we need to return to our sources for inspiration that we also need to return to our historical experience. There is a difference between Jews and Judaism. It's something interesting for us to think about. We can draw on both the religious tradition and our historical democratic and activist uh, grandmothers. Uh, and I, I hope that we can all, um, uh, the museum and we can, all, there will also be links available for other ways in which we can uh, I use Jewish sources in, in this fight that sounds like we're all uh, we'll want to work as hard as we can. I want to thank the panelists very much. It's been enormously stimulating, and thank you all for coming tonight.